Hello and welcome to this book discussion that we are having today. We are going to be talking about China's civilian army, the making of wolf warrior diplomacy. And we have with us the author Peter Martin. Peter is a journalist with Bloomberg who writes on defense and intelligence. We also have a stellar panel to discuss this book. Professor Jabin Jacob from Shivnadar University, Namrata Hasija from the Center for China Analysis and Strategy, Antara Ghoshal Singh from the Center for Social and Economic Progress. A very, very warm welcome to you all. China's civilian army is not about any secret unit within the PLA, but it is rather about the transformation, the absolute transformation of China's diplomatic core from a band of ragtag revolutionaries to a professional foreign service. And this was all under the tutelage of Chou Enlai. Peter's book discusses some of the key events in the Communist Party's diplomatic and political history. So in the last few years, we've seen China has notched a lot many successes. Some of them are like the Hong Kong handover, China's entry into the WTO, the Olympics. In the book, I personally found the personality profiles of some of the principal actors in Chinese diplomacy, like Zhou Enlai, Ke Hua. Ke Hua, again, for the benefit of our audience, is the father-in-law, is the ex-father-in-law of uh, Xi Jinping. And these are very interesting uh, character sketches. The book is replete with anecdotes, which again gives the reader a peek into the minds of China's foreign policy mandarins and its political system. Again, this is a very timely book because since the advent of Xi Jinping, we've seen China double its expenditure, its spending on its diplomacy. And this is again at a time when the US has slashed the budget for the State Department. So uh, Peter, over to you. Please tell us what this book is about, what were your motivations and some of the key points and how you went about researching this book because there are a lot of Chinese sources and you've trolled through a lot of uh, diplomatic memoirs, as I see. So over to you, Peter. Well, thanks so much for hosting me. Uh, it's a it's a real pleasure um, to join the, the ORF. Uh, I'm a big fan of, of the work that all of you do. Um, and also to be to be joined by such a distinguished panel this morning. Um, it's a real treat. Um, so so I thought I would talk a little bit about uh, how I came to write the book. Um, and then about some of the, the key findings. Um, and I guess I guess the genesis for, for, for this project kind of came from my arriving back in Beijing after a few years away in early 2017. Um, and, you know, of, of course, I was struck by the, the tremendous uh, economic and military progress that the country had made. Xi Jinping was launching or continuing to launch the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, offering you know, economic incentives to countries all around the world. He was militarizing islands in the South China Sea. Uh, and of course, he seemed to have this extraordinary opportunity to step into a global leadership role, um, given the way that, that the Trump administration was uh, you know, picking fights with US allies, uh, insulting international organizations. And yet somehow, China didn't step up and take that role. Um, and and the, the, the key kind of missing piece for me was that the ability to persuade other countries really seemed to be lacking. You know, the hard power piece worked well, but the soft power, the diplomatic power, the power to persuade um, really seemed to be, seemed to kind of fall short. And so I, I you know, and as, as, as we think about the kind of world that we're moving into where there's no, one power that can uh, set the terms of international relations, that, that ability to persuade others, that diplomatic power is going to be um, increasingly important. And yet it's an area where China seems to kind of struggle. So I started to look um, into that theme a little bit. 
and and you know the the more I, I I kind of delved into it, the more I came to see Chinese diplomats themselves as a kind of microcosm of China's broader struggle to communicate with the world. Um, and, you know, and it was this strange um, this strange kind of paradox because when you meet with Chinese diplomats on a personal level, they can they're funny, they can be very sophisticated, they speak multiple foreign languages, uh, you know, have all kinds of historical and cultural detail about the places that they're posted to. And yet when they get into meetings with foreign counterparts or when they stand up on the podium in the foreign ministry, suddenly the, the approach becomes very stilted, very ideological. Um, and, you know, of course, in recent years also, it can be quite abrasive and even aggressive at times. And and I started to wonder, you know, how how can I get a sense of where this kind of mismatch comes from? And so I, I started doing interviews in Beijing, talking to uh, Chinese diplomats as much as I could and, and to their foreign counterparts. And I also started to look for these um, memoirs that, that, that retired Chinese diplomats had written. I knew there were a couple out there, but as I as I kind of delved into it, I realized that there were more than a hundred of these things, and um, you know, in, in truth, they're pretty deadly dull books. But they contain little details that are kind of revealing about China's broader struggle, and the, you know, and what it felt like to be on the front line of of China's diplomacy through the Mao era and beyond. Um, and so I, I started to kind of think, well, if I could get enough of these books there could be a kind of broader project in here and I might be able to put something together. When I started out, wolf warrior diplomacy wasn't a phrase. This is not something the world was talking about, but um, you know, clearly in the last few years, that the way that, that Chinese diplomats have conducted themselves globally has, has led to this um, surge of interest in the topic, you know, from storming out of international meetings to insulting foreign counterparts, getting in Twitter spats with people, um, you know, the, the, it's spreading conspiracy theories around the world about the origins of, of COVID-19. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I realized from from doing all this research is that that uh, the approach that we now call wolf warrior diplomacy is actually not uh new the label is new but the approach goes back a long long way and i think i think to understand where it comes from it's important to kind of take a look at the the founding ethos of the foreign ministry um so when when the prc was founded in 1949 China basically had no diplomats to speak of. Um, it had kicked out all of the, the KMT nationalist diplomats who came before um, because it thought that they were too ideologically impure to represent this new communist state. Um, and the leadership faced this kind of paradoxical challenge. So on the one hand, this was a paranoid, secretive political regime, which was you know, a, a obsessed with secrecy. It was worried constantly about how outside forces might undermine its grip on power. Um, but at the same time, it needed to communicate with the outside world to win friends, to build influence. And so China's first foreign minister, Zhou Enlai, came up with a way of kind of squaring that circle. And, and, and you know, his idea was that the Chinese diplomatic corps would be based on um, some of the, the the animating features of the People's Liberation Army. So he, he told China's first cadre of diplomats, you'll be the People's Liberation Army in civilian clothing. And, and what he meant by that was that Chinese diplomats would be unfailingly loyal to the Communist Party. Um, they would be disciplined to a fault. And that, you know, when challenged, they would display uh, a fighting spirit uh, what he called a fighting spirit in order to uphold China's interests. And so kind of taking that uh, martial militaristic ethos, um, Chinese diplomacy kind of developed a, a set of behaviors uh, and protocols, which um, in, in many of which have lasted from 1949 right through till today. So, so Chinese diplomats will stick incredibly closely to talking points. 
uh, even if they know that those talking points don't resonate with foreign audiences. They will move around in pairs to keep tabs on each other. Um, they'll shout at foreign counterparts when they feel uh, concerned that they don't look tough enough back home. And, and, and oftentimes they'll elevate even the smallest uh, international, you know, the, the, the smallest of incidents into major international uh, upsets. And, um, you know, these, these kinds of wolf warrior displays were, were there right from the beginning. So in 1950, China sent a delegation to the United Nations in New York. Um, and the person who led that delegation, uh, Wu Xiuquan, this guy had a kind of you know, scar on his cheek and was a, a veteran revolutionary. He, he delivered a two hour speech, which Time Magazine called two awful hours of rasping vituperation. Um, and in, in the 1960s, Chinese diplomats uh, were so combative that they actually ended up in physical fights on the streets of London. And one of them was pictured wielding an ax uh, against protesters um, outside the Chinese uh, representative office there. But as long as those, uh, those wolf warrior tactics have been on display, there's also been this, this kind of alternative um, tendency which is uh, based around the idea of charming others and, and winning friends. And we saw that in the 1950s, uh, especially at the, the 1955 Bandong Conference when Zhou Enlai was incredibly uh, effective at setting aside his uh, China's kind of ideological approach to diplomacy and, and addressing the interests of people in the room. Um, and we saw it again um, in the 1990s in the aftermath of the Tiananmen massacre when uh, you know China launched this incredibly successful two-decade charm offensive, which culminated in its hosting of the 2008 Beijing Olympics. Um, and so there are these two tendencies, I think, in Chinese diplomacy, which kind of cycle in and out. Um, there's this, this tendency to kind of charm the world, and there's this tendency to tell the world off using wolf warrior tactics. And of course, in recent years, we've seen a lurch back toward the, the kind of combative assertiveness um, that, that has so often um, pervaded PRC diplomacy. And I think, I think that new combative approach has kind of been driven by two things. You know, on the one hand, there is this new confidence, which China has had since the 2008-9 financial crisis, um, when it, it started to become increasingly assertive on its periphery. And, and that confidence has become increasingly apparent since Xi Jinping became Communist Party boss and started talking about China moving closer to the center of the world stage and becoming a, you know, a leading global power by the middle of the century and all of these kind of things. But the other thing that's happened under Xi is that China's political system has become an increasingly tense and difficult place. You know, Xi has launched a sweeping anti-corruption campaign, which has punished uh, more than 1.5 million officials. Um, you know, he, he abolished presidential term limits. He's experimenting with re-education camps in, in Xinjiang. And he's he's focusing on ideology and, and in many ways cultivating um, kind of a nationalistic hostility to the outside world. And I think that when Chinese diplomats see these signals, um, they understand exactly how to interpret them. Um, and, and they know that the safest thing to do is to kind of echo that tone that Xi Jinping um, has set. And so, you know, all of, all of these factors kind of came together and then went into high gear after the, the onset of the coronavirus um, pandemic. China was under attack for its role in, uh, in starting the, uh, as, as the country where the virus originated. Uh, and, you know, there were allegations that China had covered up how the, um, the virus spread. And, um, you know, at the same time, Chinese officials kind of looked around the world and, and saw the United States and Europe floundering in response to the virus. And they felt that their system had been somewhat um, vindicated. And so that approach, I think, you know, this combination of feeling under attack, but also feeling like they had something to be proud of, um, led to this, this series of outbursts around the world, which we all kind of know now as, um, as wolf warrior diplomacy. And, you know, the host of figures that go with that from, from Zhao Lijin, former obscure diplomat in Islamabad, who picked a Twitter fight with Susan Rice and was 
you know, catapulted to, to fame inside China, to Gui Tongyo in, in Sweden, who, of course, uh, uh, you know, has, 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 has insulted pretty much everyone across the Swedish political spectrum. And when asked about it in an interview, he said, uh, for our friends, we have fine wine, and for our enemies, we have shotguns. Um, and you know, just just finally, it's it's important to to note that not everyone inside the foreign ministry likes this approach. There are detractors. There are people who feel um, that uh, that that China kind of needs to tone down the wolf warrior approach. But for now, uh, Xi Jinping, as far as I can tell, seems to like the assertive um, the the assertive approach. He seems to like, on the whole, wolf warrior tactics. And so I think for now. But those uh, those displays are here to stay, and with that, I'll wrap up. And uh, we'd love to hear what other panelists have to say. And uh, you know, thank you again for hosting me today. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for this insightful presentation on the book. I'd now like to invite Professor Jebin Jacob to share his comments. Professor Jacob. Has uh, uh, teaches a very popular course on understanding China and Chinese foreign policy. So over to you, Professor Jacob. Thank you, Kalpit. Um, let me congratulate uh, Peter once again on this book as a timely book. And I think it speaks to a lot of um, issues of interest uh, for us here in India. You know, what does uh, what makes the Chinese diplomatic establishment tick? Why is it that uh, Chinese diplomats behave the way they do? And what is it that might drive them differently from their counterparts in other countries? I think these are all questions that Peter explores in his book through a combination of historical recounting, personality profiles, and of course, locating all of this in the present. Um, now, I'd like to focus really on uh, what I see as similarities and differences uh, between the Indian and the Chinese uh, diplomatic establishments. I think uh, Peter's is a specific uh, perspective that comes from a particular approach or a particular vantage point. And uh, you know, we in India also have our own vantage point when looking at China. Uh, one, well, let me however start with this, uh, with, by saying that the you know, title is well justified. Uh, there's much that the Indians assume about the Chinese. But one of the things that uh, has seldom been talked about is this very aggressive, assertive, uh, the reason for this very assertive um, uh, standpoint or approach that Chinese do. I don't think it's, uh, it's ever been sort of connected with uh, the sort of origins of the, P of the, of the Chinese foreign ministry in um, Chow Enlai's own experiences uh, with the PLA and so on. I mean, this is an expression that comes frequently in the book that Chinese diplomats often see themselves as the equivalent of soldiers in, PL, uh, in civilian clothing. And you know, once you've got us understood this sort of a history or a, or a root of Chinese diplomatic uh, origins or uh, practice, then it makes uh, everything else makes a lot of sense. Uh, and this, uh, I think, uh, is a particularly important insight uh, in this book that he Peter gives a very clear detailed history of uh, different diplomats referring constantly to this uh, to the PLA and uh, their desire to serve their country like the PLA does uh, in the military realm uh, and therefore approaches methods uh, thinking can all be very very similar now um, in terms of similarities uh, and you know I think uh, certainly, unlike other countries, India and China have much in common as developing countries and as countries that have a similar approach to or, or similar uh, resentment uh, or indignation against being treated poorly by the uh, West-dominated international order. Uh, so in that sense, there is much that is alike in the thinking of an Indian or a Chinese diplomat. Um, Second, I thought there was an interesting uh, point that uh, Peter raises in his book, uh, in which uh, I think uh, Chow Enlai says that the Yan'an group would largely stay on in Beijing because they were the only ones with any experience uh, that of anything that resembled diplomacy, and their experience would be needed in the capital. 
you know, some years ago, I ran into a joint secretary who said uh, that his uh, objective was, uh, the EMEA's objective was to get as many Indian diplomats serving at headquarters in Delhi rather than outside. And for, to my mind, it was a very strange thing. I mean, why would diplomats be serving in the capital rather than at home, rather than out there? And it's actually because the Indian situation in many ways is similar to the Chinese situation at that point. We are a very, very small foreign service, less than a thousand people. And obviously, you know, uh, rather than spread our energy thin across every single country in the world, we believe that our resources are best employed uh, by keeping a substantial number of people at home in Delhi dealing with the world, which means that India is that many years behind, several decades behind in terms of size, capacity and resources uh, compared to the foreign ministry of China. But there are plenty of differences. Uh, you know, uh, flattery and careful stage management, stage management is something that uh, Peter refers to in terms of a Chinese skill set. This is not something that you would find uh, the Indians ever accused of, especially in the neighborhood. If anything, the general impression of the Indian diplomat in the neighborhood is insufferable, obnoxious, and vice regal in attitude. I mean, continuing with the British Raj, very protocol conscious. Now, why uh, is a good question. I suppose uh, it's because most Indian diplomats of the early years, and even perhaps today, have not done uh, a day's worth of actual labor in their lives, unlike their Chinese counterparts, who you know belong to poor families, and if not, at least went through the experiences of starvation or near starvation during the Great Leap Forward, or the, the chaos of the Cultural Revolution. Indian society uh, diplomats generally, or even uh, most of the um, bureaucratic uh, civil servant uh, civil servants in India still managed to come from the upper crust, upper caste, upper class and English uh, educated or England educated if you think of the old uh, older generation of Indian diplomats. Now uh, uh, and unlike in, in, in the case of uh, you know China, uh, the Indian Okay, India, Indians under Nehru retained the diplomatic corps or the civil service that the British left behind. Uh, Chinese Mao decided not to use any of the diplomats uh, that the nationalist or the Kuomintang government uh, used. Um, and there's another example that uh, Chow Lai at the Geneva conference, you know, he tried to take as many Chinese diplomats as possible in order to uh, uh, train them all in dealing with the world. Whereas if you, even today, of course, it's uh, partly a result of the small numbers that we have. Even today, you will find very, uh, very few Indian diplomats at, at think tank conferences or at any foreign uh, meeting. Uh, whereas, you know, there'll be a phalanx of Chinese diplomats at the same meeting. If it's a talk, if it's a meeting about China or South Asia or even Afghanistan, uh, and the Chinese ability to use the Bandung spirit is something that the Indians have really not uh, managed at all. The other imp important difference, I think is the lack of well-resourced and adequate numbers of ancillary institutions to support the MEA. The Chinese have a foreign affairs system, as Peter points out, you know, Chinese People's Institute of Foreign Affairs, People's Association of Friendship with Foreign Countries. And of course, you have WD, the United Front Work Department, the International uh, Liaison Department, and so on. Plus, Chinese provinces are far more active in foreign economic policy making uh, than Indian, Indian states, despite India being a democratic federal setup. Also, India has been unable to use its students, its journalists for foreign policy uh, ends or as diplomats or semi-diplomats uh, like the Chinese have. I mean, um, you would, one would never hear of the Doodarshan, India's national television channel as a diplomatic actor. And some of our private channels could actually instigate, yet instigate war, uh, you know, in India. That's not how the media is uh, organized or, or serves China's diplomatic purposes uh, you know, uh, in, in, in Beijing. Now, in terms of uh, questions I had, uh, I think uh, perhaps one of the things that is missing in the book is not, I mean, it's perhaps the, it's not right to give the impression that Chinese foreign policy is only conducted by the MOFA. Uh, the party organizations that I just mentioned, the United Front Work Department, the International Liaison Department, even the PLA's military diplomacy are big, big factors in China's overall foreign policy. And perhaps that is one of the reasons why Chinese diplomats feel so constrained to act so strongly and so so uh, practically uh, with foul mouth, uh, you know, right. uh, and so on. So I think, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. 
yeah uh, do you uh, i thought we had lost you so hello yeah I, i'm done yeah yeah so thank you thank I you so much for got, that yeah he, i was gonna say i think he got too close to the truth and suddenly someone cut him off so. <laughs> i actually did not catch just the last part of what jabin said probably uh, just got disconnected yeah even i think i got disconnected because uh, yes. just the last two sentences probably yeah so yeah. uh okay so I, I let me just repeat myself i, I just wanted to say that uh, chinese foreign policy isn't only about the mofa there are other party organizations such as united front work department the international liaison department that are also involved in foreign policy uh, so i mean i would have liked and also of course the pla and its military diplomacy and i suppose that's one of the reasons why china's civilian diplomats feel constrained at times because they are in competition with other elements of the party state system to make their presence felt to do their primary task better than um, you know others are i mean if you take the simple case of india's own neighborhood uh, the, there is a united front work department ambassador in pakistan in 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 bangladesh and one used to be the case in sri lanka as well so in in many ways i suppose that's one of the questions i'd like to ask peter what explains uh this sort of emphasis on party apparatchiks as diplomats now as ambassadors now uh, and you know what does that say about the relationship of the mofa with the party state yeah it's um it's a great question and and you're absolutely right that these these party organizations are central to the way that um that china conducts its diplomacy and i i guess that um you know if I, if there's uh, one Peter, Peter, strand... if i can just come in just just to, just to interrupt you uh, sure. can we can we take this at uh, the end because we need there are two more discussions we need to factor in yeah but yeah we yeah definitely yeah. have this uh, uh, you know when you get to kind of uh, uh, you know come in with your feedback and your observations yeah so um Perfect. over to you namrata and um, namrata is the second discussion of the session uh, namrata has spent a, a lot many years in taiwan which shares a, again i mean we all know that it shares a very testy relationship with china so over to you namrata uh thank you kalpit um first i think i'll congratulate peter for a for this wonderful book i thoroughly enjoyed reading it and uh thanks to orf and kalpit for organizing this uh discussion and having me here uh when you know i started reading the book especially i think um what i really liked was when he actually traced this wolf warrior diplomacy back to chawanlai because uh, the res i mean of course after covid we have seen a series of work that is coming in especially on the wolf warrior diplomacy but you know they focus very narrowly on um, you know probably the very few um, hardly uh, any work would actually take it to chawan lai but when i was reading it it actually took me back to one of um, uh, research that i did relations um, with other countries especially in the medieval uh, ages and also to the ancient ages and i found a lot of similarities in what peter just said that china always had parallel working one was of course the charm offensive and the other of course was the aggression that was there since the beginning because of the kind of uh, you know uh, the training that they had under the new china that was born in 1949 now just i know it's a little off the book but i thought it's very interesting because uh, you know when i was doing this research i actually read two primary sources that were written by chao du pu and mao huan but i also read a lot of ancient sources and histories um, that were written during the han dynasty and other dynasties in china and i think you know it whatever uh, you know right now whatever we are talking about the aggression in the foreign policy but also the way china has charmed many countries into kind of you know uh, uh, you know getting into their circle is very clear even during that time because despite their high estimation of their own culture during the ancient time when i was researching i think the chinese understood the intricacies of foreign relations they knew that china was a big civilized country but they also knew when china was vulnerable 
which made them realize that a uniform policy could not be followed when dealing with foreigners. And that, you know, you see the same even now. At least that point of uh, time, I found that China's foreign policy was very pragmatic. And they followed policies under, uh, according to the distance and relative strength of the foreign countries at any given time. So I think it kind of, uh, you know, is the same even to a certain extent, even now that, uh, you know, the peripheral diplomacy that, of course, uh, we have all read about China. So even then, China's foreign policy, you know, it actually accounted into the distance and the relative strength of the foreign countries. So it has been said that, you know, strategy was adjusted according to the strength of the adversary. The three uh, main policy options that emerged first in the Han, you know, were diplomatic accommodation, static defense, that is, you know, of course, going behind the walls, combined with punitive uh, expeditions and offensive conquest. So there were three uh, policies that the Hans followed. And somehow, again, it resonates with what is happening now. That first, of course, would be diplomatic accommodation, then probably punitive measures, and then finally an offensive. Uh, so, for example, you know, uh, the Xiongnu tribe that was living across northern frontier of China was powerful. When it was powerful, the Chinese official, they asked the emperor, please don't attack because they are very, uh, very powerful. And when the same tribe was actually uh, weakening, uh, the Chinese emperor was advised by his officials to actually go and, you know, attack. And this was a policy that they kept on following. And of course, when it comes to countries that were distant, and um, they they followed you know kind of uh, policies that suited them at that point of time and there were different ways in which of course china dealt with foreigners like matrimonial alliances was very uh, was one of the ways in which when china thought that their military is not strong against an opponent they would use that or they would you know kind of uh, bargain and um, with the other powers and you see the same kind of strategy that was followed as, you know, um, Peter just men mentioned about the Bandung conference and uh, about the other, um, you know, uh, ways in which China kind of on one hand had launched offensive against a few countries, but on the other hand, it was trying to uh, make friends with, uh, you know, a lot of countries. I will actually, because of the lack of time, there were certain other examples that I had taken out from my research, but I would not go into that. But other than that, I think uh, what um, Peter's uh, book highlighted very clearly was that, um, you know, a, there's a strong suggestion of military muscle in Chinese diplomacy, which um, I feel has, of course, been one of the mainstays of Chinese diplomacy. And Beijing uh, Beijing demonstrated willingness, of course, in recent years to use force. Now, I think this trend, um, especially noticeable since 2008, as the book has mentioned, but uh, somehow I feel that uh, when we have discussions on, um, you know, the aggressive Chinese foreign policy now, which of course has been termed as the wolf warrior diplomacy, we forget the role of, um, somehow don't mention the role of Hu Jintao who actually laid the seeds uh, for all the things that, of course, Xi Jinping carried um, in his, uh, which he's carrying on in his tenure now. Hu Jintao, uh, I think he took, first he took uh, great interest in PLA's modernization, then of course his uh, predecessors. And then it uh, it is also under Hu Jintao's leadership that China actually discarded Tang Xiaoping's policy of Tao Kuang uh, Yang Hui, which is lie low uh, and bide your time. I think it was during his um, uh, leadership that China actually moved uh, to this uh, place that we see it now. And I think a more assertive national policy has since uh, then become very evident. And that is also evident in the number of standoffs that uh, is happening between China, US and the other countries. And uh, PLA Navy, of course, uh, during it was during, the, during Hu Jintao's time that it actually ventured into the Indian Ocean on an anti-piracy mission and of course has significantly sustained uh, its presence now in uh, not only uh, the Indian Ocean, it is going of course South China Sea, East China Sea and all the uh, territorial um, um, you know, disputes that were kind of happening, be it Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, other countries, including uh, with India. Of course, uh, we see a lot of uh, um, you know, um, uh, 
things happening between India and China, which were a bit positive in the 90s, like the agreements that we signed. But during after 2007, we see that the border incursions also uh, kind of increased. And um, I think the assertiveness seen in China's policies, uh, especially in China's policies, is reflective of the newfound confidence uh, of the China's that a Chinese leadership and people and the narrative that is going on in China that the West is declining and the East is rising. I think that has been captured by uh, the Chinese leadership. And I agree with Jabin to a certain extent that we cannot look at China's diplomacy in isolation because it doesn't work like that, especially because the party's ideals and the party's policy, especially now with, uh, you know, the new Xi Jinping thought coming into um you know uh motion and also the party history that has been uh the study of party history and uh the importance of ccp and especially ccp commanding the gun and uh the influence of different departments cannot be ignored because that is what is shaping um uh, china's foreign policy not only now but over the years that is the reason that is that is what has shaped uh china's diplomacy and uh, yes, we have, at least now we have, uh, uh, I'll just come to a couple of questions that I had from Peter, because we see that, um, you know, um, at least Xi Jinping is definitely not backing down when it comes to uh, the, his foreign policy, be it the Belt and Road Initiative or be it his, um, you know, uh, policy towards US, Taiwan, India, and other countries. So he's definitely not backing out, even though one of his statements where he says that, you know, China has to be more, uh, made more lovable to the foreigners has kind of gained a little bit of traction in a lot of articles. But I think um, China's envoys to France, he made it very clear. And I think, uh, of course, that is the official line also that uh, when Xi Jinping says that he does not mean that China will, of course, um, you know, dial back on its assertive diplomacy. And also it is not going to uh, leave behind its territorial claims. So, uh, Peter, I would like to ask you, how do you think that um, it is uh, kind of uh, possible for China to sustain this diplomacy? And also uh, one um, of your line that you had written that even though uh, the diplomats that have studied abroad that, that deep-seated propaganda and also their uh, the last line where you actually say that they always look behind their shoulder. And that is the reason why, you know, probably, uh, you know, uh, they are definitely not um, at the, probably not doing, uh, you know, the, the way they are treating, um, uh, you know, other countries when it comes to diplomacy is that, is one of the reasons. But do you think that can be sustained over the, period of time Xi Jinping is not backing out the of course the diplomats are not uh, you know backing out but there's also not a consensus in China when it comes to this policy because if you look at the articles that are being published either by the academicians or even our retired military personals everyone doesn't agree with um, this wolf warrior diplomacy at least uh, how it has evolved under Xi Jinping and uh, they have uh, in, even in my personal interactions uh, when I visited China there were a few important people that said, yes, China is the best, but we don't need to tell the world. And that is one of the biggest mistakes they said Xi Jinping is making. So uh, do you think it can actually sustain over the period, period of time? And if this continues, how do you think, um, you know, uh, China's relationship with other countries is going to evolve? Because 2049 is the year earmarked by President Xi Jinping. Uh, for uh, China becoming a global uh, power with pioneering influence. For that, I think diplomacy is a must. So do you think um, that is going to, uh, you know, uh, yeah, and enable China to achieve what it wants to achieve? Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for your take on the book and also that dive into uh, ancient Chinese history. Uh, we now move on to the last discussion. Antra Ghoshal Singh. Again, Antra has studied in China and she tracks the developments that are happening in China, uh, China's foreign policy. So over to you. 
Thank you, Kalpit, and uh, many thanks to Oara for inviting me for today's discussion. Uh, it is indeed a great pleasure for me to be a part of this eminent panel. First, um, of course, many congratulations to Peter for this wonderful book. Uh, I absolutely enjoyed reading this book. And um, I, I agree with everyone uh, in this panel uh, that uh, this brilliantly tracks how China's diplomatic corps, its tradition, values, norms have evolved from uh, under China's uh, first foreign minister, Chou Enlai, to China's current uh, foreign minister, Wang Yi. Um, I think one of the key arguments of the book is that China's new assertive diplomatic approach that the world is so concerned about today is not entirely uh, a new phenomena. Uh, it is very much rooted, it was there, and it was, I mean, like forever in, in Chinese tradition and, and history. Um, the book argues that the diplomatic corps in China, which is modeled after the PLA, uh, always had an inherent militaristic tendency and inclination towards displaying what it calls a fighting spirit whenever necessary and whenever under pressure. I think this is one argument many within Indian diplomatic circles would agree to a great extent, given their own experience of dealing with uh, Chinese diplomats over various contentious issues like the China-India border dispute, Tibet, Pakistan, and others, you know, since the, since the very early years of uh, India's independence. The, other interesting argument that the book makes is about the continuity and not changes that mark the functioning of uh, Chinese diplomats. For example, the book rightly notes how the traditional emphasis on political purity, loyalty, discipline, uh, it, you know, it still serves as a key criteria for selection of recruits in Chinese foreign ministry. The culture of discipline, secrecy, um, uh, limited discretionary authority, the use of flattery or stage management as diplomatic tools were as popular, I mean, it, it's as popular uh, today as it has been in the 50s and, and before that. Uh, it, it also mentions about, you know, as um, Professor Jabin uh, mentioned, uh, the various um, party organs such as the United Front's uh, work, de uh, work department, the International Riaso uh, Department and the Propaganda Department, which are still among some of the um, most active organs or organizations of Chinese diplomacy. Even the diplomatic cliches in China's communication strategy and their relevance has uh, largely remained uh, unchanged over the years. Um, Chinese diplomats today are, of course, much better trained than the more sophisticated, more confident, but still there remains many things that remain uh, unchanged about them. And, um, and one of the most important thing is, uh, you know, their uh, inability to insulate themselves from the, the constraints of Chinese political system. Uh, the book highlights how Chinese diplomats throughout history had to defend the indefensible, like the Great Leap Forward, the anti rightist campaign, um, you know, the Cultural Revolution, the Tiananmen incident. And that has led to a diplomatic tradition in China to stick to, you know, like, um, official talk points or be defensive or, or aggressive when when uh, countered. And Peter sees this trend getting further intensified with the ascendancy and consolidation of power by Xi Jinping and his various, you know, and his, um, the entire nationalist uh, agenda. And uh, therefore, Chinese diplomats are once again adjusting to the volatile political situation at home through public displays of loyalty to the leadership and aggressive nationalistic posturing. Um, the book argues that the latest trend of clearing aggressiveness in China's behavior is the manifestation of not just newfound self-confidence from China's dramatic rise, but also because of this fresh insecurities rising out of the, uh, you know, the highly charged political atmosphere in, um, in China. Uh, the third very refreshing aspect of the book is how it brings out the dichotomy or the, or the constant tension within Chinese diplomacy. Uh, at least I see it as a tension or dilemma than a deliberate strategy between what the book calls China's charm instinct versus China's uh, bully instinct. 
so on one hand, it wants to make friends and expand influence and gain respectability. While on the other hand, it is like super jittery over, over foreign influence and um, it is distrustful about the outside world. Uh, so, uh, you know, we also see uh, on one hand, China seeks global empathy as it, uh, as it strives to undo its past humiliations and claim its lost glory. On the other hand, it seems to have no qualms about, uh, you know, itself adding to others' humiliation. Um, as the book notes about Yang Jiechi's uh, comments summarizing the Chinese sensibility that China is a big country and other countries are small. So that is a fact that uh, these countries have to live with. We in India also had similar experience in, in recent times when uh, Shani, a popular uh, Chinese scholar and political commentator at the Fudan University in Shanghai, justified certain uh, social media handles of certain, uh, you know, um, Chinese government institution making fun of the COVID crisis in India. He said, uh, where can a 800 pound gorilla sleep? Wherever it wants to. So this constant tension, a dilemma in, in, in Chinese diplomacy is, I, I think, I find it to be very intriguing. Um, as everyone said, Peter's analysis is uh, particularly interesting in the contextualization of China's diplomatic journey in the background of major political developments within and outside China. Uh, while narrating history, um, it provides interesting examples of Chinese diplomatic practices from all around the world. It constantly connects the, and it tops it with biographies and, uh, you know, personal details, nitty gritties, inside stories about various Chinese stalwarts, including President uh, Xi Jinping. I think that is uh, another very interesting aspect uh, of the book. The only concern I have is about uh, the argument, um, you know, the, the merit demerit argument of China's diplomatic uh, approach. I agree with Peter that uh, the Chinese approach is effective at formulating demands or delivering strong message or projecting a united, uh, a, stro a forceful united front uh, at negotiation table. But regarding the weakness of the Chinese diplomatic approach, the book's argument in its present form, I think it's slightly, uh, you know, less convincing. It argues that because of China's unique diplomatic approach, it has failed to win hearts and minds of nations. Although it might have, you know, succeeded in uh, silencing its critics, but it has somehow failed to persuade others to share uh, Beijing's, uh, Beijing's point of view. And therefore, China is left with very few true friends. I'm not sure if, you know, other powers who do not follow China's diplomatic approach have been particularly successful in, in winning the minds and hearts of one and all in the international community. Or if true friendship between nations really exists in the current international scenario. So that is just one aspect that I wanted to highlight. Otherwise, I think it's a, it's a brilliant book and um, one of the most important, I mean, uh, one of the most important features is it, it gives a reference, uh, to, it helps people to contextualize, to better understand, uh, you know, the the, um, pre the Chinese diplomacy as, as we see it around us today. Uh, so, yes, I think um, it's, it's an essential read for everyone who is interested uh, in China, both within India, outside India. And so I'll stop here. And once again, many congrats, congratulations, Pete. For, uh, for this wonderful feat. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, thank you, Antra. And uh, I thank all the discussants for their comments and observations on Peter's book. Uh, we have about 10 minutes. And I think in those 10 minutes, uh, Peter, if you could uh, summarize your responses to some of the comments and take some of the questions that have been posed by the panel. So it's over to you again. Well, thanks so much. Uh, that was a great discussion. I learned, uh, I learned a ton, and uh, I really, really enjoyed everyone's um, everyone's comments. Um, so, I, I guess I'll just I'll just focus on um, a, a kind of a few of the points that that came up um, in terms of the role of party organisations. Uh, you know, it's it's absolutely crucial, um, and uh, you know, I, I wish that there had been. Um, more kind of more space to delve into the United Front Work Department and 
the People's Liberation Army's own approach to diplomacy and all of these topics are being worked on by people um, around the world, as you all know, uh, and uh, very, very, you know, worthy of study in their own in their own right. Um, I guess that the in, when it comes to party control, that the kind of thread that I see um, running through Xi's, uh, Xi Jinping's approach to governance is this idea that uh, there should be a strong party center commanded by one central leader and a bureaucracy uh, which is responsive to that person's uh, demands. And so, you know, whether that is state-owned enterprises, economic ministries, the foreign ministry, or the rest of the, the party's diplomatic apparatus, they all need to respond to these, these diktats from the center. And, uh, you know, sometimes that ends up um, strengthening the hand of uh, foreign ministry actors. So, you know, oftentimes in, in Chinese embassies, the, the ambassador will act as party secretary. Um, and, uh, you know, recent reforms inside the foreign ministry have, have kind of strengthened the hand of the ambassador inside, inside embassies and uh, uh, made sure that uh, representatives of different ministries in the, in, in the embassy all report to him uh, or her directly. Um, so, so in that case, that's that's something that's kind of strengthened MOFA a little bit on the whole. And there, you know, there are cases, of course, where uh, MOFA needs to take a backseat to other party organisations. But uh, the kind of the common theme that runs through all of those changes is that she wants the party in charge, and that she wants himself to be in charge of the party. Um, so, so, so I guess that's the kind of common theme. Um, I found uh, the discussion of, of, of Chinese history um, really fascinating, um, and it's important, of course, to remember that uh, the, some of the you know elements of the high-handed approach that China has taken um, in recent years have uh, long, long roots um, back into China's past. And people like Howard French have written um, really interesting stuff about um, how that that historical legacy kind of lives on today um, uh, in, in many ways in the PRC. And I, you know, I, I think that kind of another, another kind of complementary point to that was the discussion of how Indian diplomats are often seen as insufferable by, by India's neighbors. Um, and I guess, um, you know, as, as different as the, the governance systems of India and China are, um, and that the, the, the traditions of diplomacy in each country, what they have in common is that, you know, the sheer size and pull of those economic and political um, systems and uh, the kind of palpable impact that that has on um, on any neighbors surrounding them. And, and that sometimes, uh, you know, rudeness and high handedness just uh, are a function of raw power. Um, so that's, you know, that's important in the Chinese context. And it sounds like uh, it's very important in the um, in the Indian context too. Um, I think you know, kind of staying on the the theme of of India and its strengths and weaknesses. Um, one one thing that has always struck me about the country, uh, which you know, as as you said, has this this tiny um, foreign service, um, is the is the ability. Um, of in, a little bit like America, of, of the ability of Indian society and Indian culture to speak out in a kind of uh, less constrained way than uh, than happens in in the Chinese context. You know, I live in uh, in Northern Virginia. If you go into a coffee shop on a Saturday morning, you'll see that uh, I don't know half, three quarters of the people in there are all wearing yoga pants and have just left. Uh, a lesson where they all said namaste at the end of, of the session and you know that's that's a it that's not necessarily something that the indian government has always been very good at capitalizing on but um but it's something that that kind of stems from indian society and indian culture and in a way that that china really struggles with um probably precisely because it's its government takes such a heavy-handed uh role to um you know, it's such a central role to the way that, that the country communicates with um, with the world. So I, I, I kind of I think that that's um, that's one contrast that that I want to think about um, a little bit more. And then you know, finally, uh, to this question of whether things will change and whether 
China's the, the current trajectory of Chinese diplomacy can be sustained. Um, I don't I don't really know the answer, and and I think it's it's something that, as, as all of you know, is is puzzling a lot of China watchers at the moment. You know, in the past, when China has gone through these periods where its its foreign policy has upset other nations and has has been an isolated position, especially the Cultural Revolution, but also, of course, the, the Tiananmen Massacre, there have been these incredibly successful periods of recalibration in Chinese foreign affairs. There's been, there's been a period of overreach and then a period of a reset where China has been able to start building friends and, and influence again. Um, and I, I guess, um, you know, a, a couple of thoughts come to mind. You know, when China has been successful in doing that, um, it's typically been able to articulate quite a narrow, limited set of goals for its foreign policy, and then pursue those goals with um, with great discipline. So, uh, you know, in, in the aftermath of Tiananmen, I think the goal was really to remove foreign sanctions and improve China's reputation so that uh, the country had enough space to pursue economic reforms at home and to build its national power. But under Xi Jinping, China has, has taken on such an expansive view of its interests and such a wide ranging um, agenda for its foreign policy. You know, just, just think, of, think of the reach of the, the Belt and Road alone or the number of countries that it touches on. But it's, it's, um, it's, it's hard for me to, to see Chinese foreign policy kind of falling back and uh, starting to take on a, a narrower set of goals again. Um, and I think that, you know, e even more important than that is that in the past, these periods of recalibration have involved an assessment of the international system and of China's place in the international system, which has prompted the country's leaders to think in terms of, of, of you know, maintaining this kind of humble, low key approach as a point of necessity, you know, um, in the, in the early 1990s, US power was so preponderant that there was really no choice for China there. And there could be very little debate about what the right approach um, was for the country. But now there's this analysis, I think, from a lot of Chinese elites that the US is in irreversible decline, that its political system is broken, that its alliance system is weaker, and that China's system offers a viable alternative uh, which has proved itself time and time again from the global financial crisis through to the coronavirus pandemic uh, and of course not not all of us on that on the panel will agree with the analysis that that Beijing has but you know that that seems to be their analysis um, nevertheless and I think until the US and its partners are able to dissuade Beijing of that um, uh, that kind of central um, analysis of the international system and of, of the way that democracies and uh, and, and non-democracies interact, I think it's going to be very, very hard to see any kind of sustained um, recalibration from, from Beijing in terms of its foreign policy. Um, and I guess, you know, with that, I will, um, I'll leave the discussion there. But, you know, thank you uh, again to the ORF and to all of the panelists for a wonderful discussion today. Yeah, uh, thank you everyone. Thank you, Peter. Thank you everyone, uh, especially the discussions for logging in and I mean, especially taking out time for this book discussion today. And um, to our readers, I strongly suggest you read this book because as a, as a rising power, I think we need to broaden our understanding of Chinese diplomacy and what goes on in the minds of Chinese foreign policy Mandarin. So stay tuned again stay tuned and this is all the time we have but stay tuned for many more such interesting discussions and informative sessions on international relations diplomacy geopolitics and geoeconomics on the orf online platform thank you thank you